Spivak's translation of Devi, an Indian woman in a new decolonized nation with many anxieties about the definitions of nation and citizenship and rights being foisted upon her, has turned to creative writing and political activism. Um, the words with which we describe the problem, Davy's problem, are inadequate. Culture as we use it today is a misfit to Davy's increasingly complicated, layered uh, situation. Professor Spivak suggests that no terminology is adequate, that there are no models for representation, or for that matter, translation. Even feminist terminology and concepts as derived in the West are inadequate. I guess my point is here is that the women that Davy describes in her fiction are singular women in specific situations. Definitions of the global or utopia do not apply. Davy's characters' lives are touched by globalization, government men, business officials, landowners, outside contractors. Their actions and reactions to such forces are highly specific. Davy's point, and I think Professor Spivak's as well, is to illustrate how estranging, or here I have a typo, as strangling, <laughs> the utopias of modernization and globalization are in specific instances of women's lives. How terms like science, democracy, individual rights are misnomers, invasive in their own way. The cure is often a poison. The solution is already a dissolution. Catechesis, I think, works well on these misfirings on a synchronic level, where there are misfits between language and misfirings on a horizontal plane. How does one talk about this historically? Misfirings layered upon misfirings layered upon misfirings. Spivak uses the word metalepsis, and I think that's a, a, a very good one. Metalepsis refers to the substitution of one figure of speech for another, as in the translation of a metaphor by another metaphor, often with equally questionable accuracy. Cultural privileging of certain terms and concepts and modes of expression play a huge role. If a Western white heterohumanist culture selects and translates texts that conform to and support a worldview vision forms, utilizing tropes that continue to minimize ideas and forms of expression of women, minorities, gays, tribal groups. In Western civilization, these tropes have been built upon tropes over time to the point that certain beliefs become universalized, globalized. When Spivak uses the word metalepsis, she is also pointing out that the effect, often some sort of universal superior idea or being, is substituted for a cause, often some sort of racial, gender, economic discrimination. In many cases, the minority assimilates to the dominant culture or belief system and begins to accept socially and mentally the philosophical, literary, or religious explanations for the condition thereby reifying the ideological construct and losing sight of the complex causes. Those who study colonization are well aware of these processes. Nevertheless, it becomes very hard to unpack such historical layers over time. To do so, I suggest that the opposite meaning of incultural, enculturation would be helpful, an undoing of the acultural process in order to see the discriminatory translational <coughs> practices at work. I need a. Yeah. I have no. Excuse me. <laughs> Here the historical work of the translation studies scholar might be analogous to the psychotherapist. The goal is to strip away those decades of repression, avoidance, assimilation, acceptance, rationalization, reversing those rational and positivistic translational forms and meaning to better access the past formative moments 
in which early memories and associations, insights and repressions arose. I have turned to the work of Jean Laplanche, who has suggested we use concepts such as detranslation or dismantling in an article called Psychoanalysis, Time and Translation, Laplanche writes, quote, insofar as the analytic method can be understood by analogy with the process of translation, interpretation in terms of the past, the archaic, the infantile, is not a translation, but a detranslation, a dismantling, a reversal of translation. The goal is less an uncovering of the true or origin original meaning of a source text. Rather, it is, a, it is an historical attempt to reveal the metaleptical historical process at work and to allow openings and gaps in the silent system for alternative viewpoints and modes of expression. In Gayatri's words today in the paper that she did not read, the goal involves a reading of globalization that looks less at the signs as unities and universals and instead at the, at the sea of traces that suggest that there once was something else there, excesses that have not been assimilated into a world of meaning. Thus, I find it very important for translation studies to focus on both aspects of enculturation the positivistic sense that the Catholic Church uses it, creating inroads into a culture, and the oppositional, maybe ill translation, ill culturation, negative sense, to look at what does not fit and why. Translation studies has done a pretty good job of analyzing that which has been translated, the glass half full, the empirical studies. But it has not done a very good job at all when looking at what gets left out of translation, the glass half empty. My sense is, is that translation study scholars tend to over -fo focus on the former, thinking that the remainder is minimal. My sense is that the remainder, thanks to scholars such as Professor Spivak, is larger than we think, and it may be the majority. All right. At the end of her paper, which she did not read, Professor Spivak turns to the metapsychological, that there is a never-ending weaving that goes back and forth in the mind of humans from infants on as they begin to discover and process the world out there. This may not just reveal how the self is gendered, but how many abstract concepts which colonize and discriminate are formed through translational processes. In translation studies, this has been explored by some Canadian feminist scholars such as Sherry Simon, Louise von Flotto, Suzanne Lopin de Lopinier Harwood. These scholars pick up on the ethics of translation by Behrman and Benjamin, advocating difference in translation. You know them well. Today I want to draw your attention, this is my conclusion, of uh, the work by Carolyn Shredden, who is a former student of mine. She began, the, uh, she began her work at the uh, University of Massachusetts, but she's clearly progressed well beyond her professor, which makes professors very happy. Uh, Carolyn Shredden has a couple of articles out on the uh, insight uh, of the uh, Israeli artist, psychoanalysis, and feminist theorist uh, Bracha Ettinger. Ettinger posits the concept of matrix, a feminist symbol based upon prenatal mother-infant relations. So Professor Spivak in her paper was talking about infant relations with the world. Uh, Shred is going back to look at the prenatal mother-infant relations a supplement to the missing symbol in Freudian Lacanian analysis. For Shred, the matrixial mother-infant relations allow exchanges that precede and destabilize later phallic symbol, symbolic systems. 
the communication, the exchanges, the translation processes in the womb changes the space from an empty or passive receptacle, a no place in Freudian and Lacanian psychology, a utopia, to an active communication space that's constantly reforming via translational processes. New categories emerge, not inculturating, not rejecting, but being in a state of being next to, being in proximity to another, gaining trust, empathy, love, without a sign system, communicating without ownership, without possession. Ettinger and Shred call this form of translation metamorphosis. And rather than using a definition based upon metaphor or metonymy, metra here refers to mater or the mother, and morphosis refers to Morpheus, the Greek god of sleep and dreams. I find it similar to a pre-ethical, pre-gender, pre-symbolic order that Professor Spivak articulates in her talk. In this model, translation is seen as generative, forming new identities, new, uh, new entities, new identities, <laughs> rather than one of replacement and supplement. Uh, supplanting. Uh, it's a, um, with an inferior version, translation is instead seen as a mutually informing and transforming process where translation and the original meet create creatively, recognizing and accepting a shared heritage, yet open to relations of difference and multiple meanings. Joyce and Trieste, Brossard and Montreal, the space itself is a very intimate one, which would also underscore Professor Spivak's call for the translator to facilitate love in translation, to bring about new relations with the other, and to allow the foreign to surface from the inside, changing not only culture, but individual selves, proximity without possession. Thank you.